to begin. All right, so good morning to, to all of you. I am Juan Ramon Real. I work as a technical manager for the Research U project at the University of Cadiz. And it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the third session of the Spin-Off Competence Lab. Uh, the Spin-Off Competence Lab, as some of you who already are familiar with this initiative and have repeatedly attended our events, is an initiative that broadly speaking intends to promote entrepreneurship among our research communities with a special focus on uh, early stage researchers so that, uh, well, we hope we can give you with this series of webinars, uh, the tools necessary and the knowledge necessary to turn your research projects into business ideas. Today, we are having Ivika Mitrovic, uh, and he will be delivering a presentation on the spe speculative design methodology. Uh, there are still some uh, attendees waiting on the, on the meeting room. I will be letting them in in the meantime, but uh, Professor Ivica, if, if you consider it all right, it's a good moment to start with the session. Thank you very much for being with us today. And please, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, thank you, organizers, you as organizers and University of Split for uh, for invitation for this uh, interesting lecture. And maybe you're going to ask yourself why speculative design is a part of this kind of uh, a series of lectures. Uh, the first reason is because it's becoming kind of buzzword today and and, uh, and becoming very, very popular uh, approach in design, but not only in design, but in uh, design related to the technology. And of course, I have to be, uh, you have to be aware that uh, my uh, lecture will be most critical, critical about use of design in the everyday life about uh, you know, the use of technology, but I think it's something which is uh, important for every one of you at the beginning of your uh, academic or uh, professional career. I'm going to start with, uh, uh, with the slides. Uh, uh, so basically, th this session today will be my lecture, which is going to be around one hour, and then I'm going to open a panel for discussion for the question for any kind of comment. Uh, in the last uh, half of hour of uh, of today's session, I hope we can go without the break. Uh, it's uh, one and a half hour. I think I think we could all uh, follow uh, this session in in this 19 minutes, around 90 minutes. Uh, I'm going to start to share my screen. Uh, share sound. Okay, there. And uh, let me see. Okay, and uh, probably there is not lots of people coming from design background for this session. So uh, I'm gonna try and this lecture is uh, uh, focused uh, on the speculative design, but very briefly as introduction in this uh, design approach, or maybe some call it methodology, methodology but it's more approach uh, from my uh, personal perspective as a research and educator. A little bit about my background. Uh, uh, I'm end up uh, at, at the end, I end up in the design and art uh, uh, environment, teaching at, uh, uh, I'm head of the visual communication department at the Arts Academy in Split, at University in Split, and uh, having professorship uh, in uh, art and design, but basically my background is in uh, master degree and PhD degree in uh, computer science, uh, precisely in artificial intelligence. So basically, whole my career was uh, connected with uh, with the technology uh, and what is the role of the of the technology in, in the society. And speculative design is a kind of uh, natural way uh, or natural direction in my career. Uh, connecting design and the technology and the role of the uh, technology and design in the society. 
but of course, when we when we talking about design and in, in relation uh, uh, in, and design relation and technology, it's impossible not talking about broader social, economic, and political context. That's something which I'm always very interesting to to be focused in, and that's also reason why part of my uh master uh, master and phd research was uh, uh, was uh, uh, connected with the social science okay uh, so basically the lecture will be uh, structured in three uh, uh, in in three sessions the the first sessions uh, is a session dealing with the past of this practice uh, we are choosing historical references the session two will be or is going to deal with the present with selected case studies uh, with employed approaches tools and methods and the uh, future parts it's the the, the, the last session uh, will be a session with a critical view of the speculative practice today and and uh, and and the future of the of the practice well wow, you'd be great you and ralph I don't know if I could have a kid in a world like this. Oh, that's happy, thanks. Really, though? It's... It is like that Rook woman said. Things were okay a few years ago, before 2008. Do you remember back then? We used to think politics was boring. Those were the days. But now, I worry about everything. I don't know what to worry about first. Never mind the government. It's the sodding banks. They terrify me. And it's not even them. It's the companies, the brands, the corporations. They treat us like algorithms while they go around poisoning the air and the temperature and the brain and don't even start me on ISIS. Well, now we've got America. Never thought I'd be scared of America in a million years, but we've got fake news and false facts. And I don't even know what's true anymore. What sort of world are we in? Because <laughs> if it's this bad now, what's it going to be like for you? Huh? 30 years' time, 10 years, five years. What's it going to be like? Uh, this is from the BBC serial called Years and Years uh, from 2017, as I as I think of, uh, which is uh, uh, follows a turbulent 15 years in the future of one British family. And here in this scene, one of the main characters, he talks about how we have lost our faith in the future. Because the future uh, doesn't look anymore like this. This is the future. When I was a kid or teenager in the 80s, the future was something bright, uh, something fo focused on the really cool gadgets and something focused on really like uh, a kind of feeling really like a, a future. We were dreaming and we were like every morning we were dreaming about what is going to happen tomorrow with some kind of uh, 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 faith in the future and, and, and some kind of really excitement. But with the process, with some uh, 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 theoreticians called uh, uh, the slow cancellation of the future, which started in the second part of the of the of the last century, or twentieth century, our future has been slowly colonized, colon, colonized by the dominant economic model. And sadly, we have lost our ability to imagine alternatives: what is possible, what is probable, and what is desirable. And design, as one of the main drivers of the modernism, uh, since its rapid growth during the last century, mostly played this uncritical supporting role to the industry and to the application of technology. And of course, in this century, with globalization and new technologies, uh, for example, big data, automatization, Internet of Things, smart thing, smart city, uh, nano and biotechnologies. Uh, all these new technologies uh, provided a great possibilities in the context of which design is the fundamental distinctive element of new products and new services. All these new products, systems and services uh, developed in such context with the design as a driver of, of uh, innovation had a dramatic consequences of the society. And in the short time, have shocked economic and legal and labor systems in the many cities and countries, for example, Uber, Airbnb, and, and the similar uh, uh, product or services. 
Unfortunately, design had its role in the building of so-called Anthropocene, or some people call it Capitalocene time, time uh, where we are living now, which is more than ever in human history, which, which more than ever in human history is open possibilities for extreme catastrophic scenarios. And on the other hand, also back to these scenarios, it's, it's not the kind of uh, 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 distant future scenario. There are scenarios which is almost happening now, or there are scenarios which is really coming in, in the near future. And, but on the other hand, uh, we, we saw, we see, or we have seen around us a new design competitions focusing on finding solution for the biggest international problems. It, it's a kind of uh, direction or trend that brought back this modernistic myths about this revolutionary role of design as a discipline that would change the world. And number of designers or design stars uh, believe that new disasters or time of crisis create new opportunities for designers. It looks that it looked the designers were the only ones capable of stopping this cycle of capitalism. But these projects, most of the time, bringing approaches that intended to resolve problems, they have been resulted from the technological development with new and new innovations. But and end that it most, most cases results in design and production of another new technology or another new technologies. And this phenomena, uh, we have been described as a so-called Western melancholy. It's a process in which designer focus on the consequences of the current situation instead of dealing with the causes of particular problem. The project that carry mostly this idea about genius creative person or scientists who are the only ones possessing the necessary knowledge and wisdom and who are going to save, of course, via innovation and technology, the planet from self-destruction. And if we look deeper, such colossal and mythic projects use the same rhetoric and ideology of the past centuries as well terms like conquest, colonization, and so on, and so on. This phenomenon of pest and melancholy can be also observed in the mainstream Hollywood production. For example, this is a blockbuster Geostorm from, I think, 2018 or something like this, where in this scenario at the beginning, there is a network of satellites around the planet, again, new technology, which controls the climate change. And Geostorm is just one of the many movies dealing with climate change, produced at a main, mainstream level during the last decade. I'm going to share a lot of examples from the pop, pop culture because uh, design was always in relationship with the pop, pop culture, but is also interesting as a, as a kind of a, a study. Of, of the trends in the society. And it's just one of the examples of these uh, scenarios when where a human mythical hero scientist uh, saves the planet. And one of the most important science fiction writers, Ursula Le Guin, uh, she talks about uh, so-called techno heroism. She's very critical and she called this similar trend as a techno heroism. And this imaginary of the future are not so unexpected. If you look into today education, which is mostly still based on this hyper techno optimism. So this worldview is rooted in the number of dogmas, for example, that human evolved from the observer into creator, and then in the name of the progress and grow, he or we can change environment. And 
that these consequences of human activity is going to be resolved by means of science and technology anyway. We can understand this Western melancholy as a ultimate consequences of accepting our incapacity to stop the devastation of environment. And however, as a reaction, designers started to practice different approaches to design. Moving from this dominant perception and conventional design practices and starting to rethink and rethinking the role of technology in our everyday lives, focusing on implications rather than applications of technology, which means not just working on applications of the different new and cool technologies, but thinking about possible scenarios, what is going to happen when this technology starting or became, became part of our everyday life. They started to speculate about new technological, but as well social, economical, and political futures. And as I said before, how new technologies will change our life when it comes to our homes. This is something probably uh, some of you are familiar with. It's a, a Gartner, it's a forecasting company, uh, forecasting the future in technology. And this is their diagram showing uh, what is the cycle of new technologies in, in perception in everyday life from this uh, beginning at, at the beginning of the graph to this excitement and, and the peak of, of this graph to at the end we see like normalization or we call domestification of technology when some technology became uh, uh, part of our everyday life. And Speculative design practice, it's probably one of the most significant examples of such new design practices. Expanding this critical practice toward imagination and diverse vision of the possible future scenarios. It is root is something which is called English critical design, uh, which started in the, in the late 19th and became established in the, in the beginning of the, of the, of the, of the 2000. Uh, uh, at the uh, Royal College of Art in UK, in London, uh, started as a kind of practice and then educational practice by Anthony Dunn and Fiona Rebbe. And this is kind of, uh, this diagram, it's, it's kind, they call it uh, AB uh, manifest. It's, kind, it's a basically a manifesto where in the left uh, uh, column we see the uh, traditional design practice and in the right column we see what, is, what are the characteristics of the critical and speculative design practice. So moving from affirmative to critical, from problem solving to problem finding, um, for, from providing answers to ask uh, uh, questions and so on and so on. It's a kind of manifesto which is uh, uh, deeply in the roots of the, of the critical speculative design practice. But if you go even uh, uh, more backward to the, in, into the past, uh, one of the main uh, uh, historical references are, of course, the Italian radical practice in design and architecture from the 70s and 60s, mostly from 70s and 80s, which uh, confronted uh, the high modernism as a domi dominant ideology of the time, of that time, uh, by focusing on social issues and rethinking the profession of uh, design and uh, architecture. And uh, speculative design, it's our practice is dealing with the notion of what is the preferable future and for whom is the preferable. preferable. This is the future con, one of the main tools uh, uh, which use uh, people uh, dealing with future forecasting or, of course, and critical speculative designers. And you see it's a con because the future is not linear. Future is there is a, a multiplicity of the possible future. So we're starting from today and we're going through from today to uh, uh, a certain future. This future could be like uh, uh, linear or it could be somewhere in the 
uh, in the in this like in, in, in this cone uh, which is which is here. So there is a probable future, which uh, it's like all the circumstances in the in the in the in the world today or your uh, local context stay the same. We're gonna end up in the probable future, but there is also lots of other possibilities. There are plausible futures, and there is like huge possibilities of possible futures all outside this cone. It's uh, uh, not scientifically scientifically possible. So you can see that the future there is no always there is no one future, and there is like lots of opportunity in the future. And uh, what we as a speculative designers uh, 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 do, uh, we are trying to imagine uh, all different possible scenarios in order to discuss, to think about, to be prepared, to be critical about all these possible futures uh, we see uh, on this uh, diagram. And uh, of course, what is a preferable future and for whom is a prefer and who, for whom is it's a preferable for the corporation, for the industry, for government, for, for us as a citizens, and also who owns the future? Do we as a citizens or, or, or individuals owns the future? And it, this is a kind of uh, 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 space or design space we, uh, we, are, we are working or uh, we are dealing with. And it is related to the series of similar practices you can see here. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, for example, critical design, design fiction, radical design, discursive design, traditional design, and, and so on, and, and, and so on. And we as the practitioners uh, and, and the people who do all, deal also with the... Uh, mm, uh, with the methodology of the field, we see it more as a kind of approach uh, or kind of attitude or position rather than traditionally defined methodology. So, but however, we can still point some of the distinctive characteristic of the approach and we could determine, determine a basic framework. And since the speculative design uh, continuously interact with the other related practices, fields, and disciplines. It uses any methods and tools and approach that, that, is, that are accessible and appropriate at a given moment. For example, uh, in our project, uh, uh, they are not only designers, they are people coming from different backgrounds, from IT, architecture, uh, social science, psychology, uh, uh, modern art, anthropology, ethnography, uh, civil construction. So there is a kind of a framework or kind of approach where all the like different backgrounds could discuss together and trying to build a different project or scenarios of different futures. And in last few years, to be precise, last uh, more than 20 years, specul speculative des design became very much in fashion. There is more and more designers which are embraced speculative and related design approaches in their everyday practice. There are more and more studies or design studios producing visions of the future technological scenario. There are more and more companies where employing these, where more and more companies were employing designers to imagine future trends. This is like a, a Google design, there is a kind of small group in Google design for, uh, uh, which is dealing with uh, speculative design as a tool uh, in their everyday practice. There were more and more mainstream conferences and exhibition dedicated to the futures in a related, in a related uh, uh, to speculative design. We are talking about uh, conferences and, and exhibition, which was, uh, which is, which were and which, which are still open for the broad and, and, and mainstream audience, not just for the uh, art expert designers and, and so on and so on. And we were witnessing an increasing number of educational programs based on the speculative practice as a kind of tool for changing the future. And for potential students, they uh, became kind of hype or cool places for, for studying. 
However, uh, and luckily, uh, specular design were confronted with a strong criticism during this uh, uh, last 20 years, so to be precise, last maybe 10 years, uh, that is separated from the real world. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, working in the galleries, uh, some research laboratories and academic context uh, that is coming from the privileged Western position. Uh, most of the projects are practiced by the people coming from the West, uh, mostly white males uh, uh, were like a project coordinators or, or running the project. And that it's look salvation in the dystopia scenarios, not dealing with the present, with the with the current situation, current problems, but you know, thinking about like a, a starting, uh, a starting, uh, uh, thinking about like a, uh, catastrophic scenario as, as a possible starting point for the building a new new society or or better society. And of course, science fiction has always been been a great inspiration within design practice, not design, but also architectural practice, and of course uh, any kind of practice which is dealing with the, with the creativity, uh, because it has this long history of creating imaginary scenarios, world and characters. And however, these visions of the future also served as a tool in the hands of the big, big corporations in realization of their preferable futures, which are usually built around corporate or corporation technologies. One of the best known examples is this. This is 1939 New York uh, World Exhibition and uh, uh, the biggest uh, pavilion was uh, uh, this one uh, designed by the uh, American industrial design legend Norman ben, uh, Bell Gates and General Motors and the name of this pavilion was Futurama and this idea of this pavilion was uh, 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 representing the vision of America city in, of the future in 1960 so looking in in 30 or 35 years uh, of the future in, in uh, 30 uh, 30 years in the future and uh, of course, as we see here, it, it was kind of accurate uh, 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 forecasting of the future, but you know, the future was not designed to suit the humans, but uh, to suit cars and highways, uh, which was, uh, of course, like the main uh, uh, product of uh, General Motors as a company. And this kind of uh, corporate corporative uh, fetishization of technology uh, dictate the role of technology in society. This is a similar example, uh, IBM presentation at, at the World Fair in 1964 in New York again, designed by another design, uh, industrial design legends, Charles and Alexandra Ems, which was focused on uh, artificial intelligence which at that time was a technology most developed during the Cold War time. And we had this warfare, uh, the technology or IBM was seeking for it new market position and it's, uh, it's, it's new life. And similar, rhetoric is nowadays used by many big corporations, mostly in the IT world. And keywords uh, such as uh, safety, optimization, efficiency, speed and similar, are used in all corporate visions of the future, built around their new technology. This is Microsoft, I think, 2016 or something vision of the future. And, but we can see that uh, uh, this vision of future are, are entirely dehumanized. Uh, mostly people are props for the technology, not, the, 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 not, not people using technology, but you know, mostly technology using the people in, in, in these scenarios. So, and of course, technology is always working perfect. There is no bugs, there is no any kind of uh, glitches and, and so on and so on. But luckily, if we look more in the pop culture, future scenarios presented in the film and TV production include criticism and offers much more fun. This is something from my generation. It's a cult TV series, The Twilight Zone, uh, which was most, mostly popular in the 60s and 70s, which then as one of the most significant mainstream examples of the speculation about possible future, dealing lots of also with the technology, but also uh, all these cultural and political uh, uh, context. 
And of course, today we are witnessing a growing of we are witnessing a growing production of dystopian stories in the mainstream Western context. And uh, this is uh, the, the most famous one. Uh, it's 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 a follow follow up uh, or follower uh, of the Twilight Zone for the 21st century, and it was apparent that dystopians were back in the fashion, uh, and dystopian literature were, were also on the rise. In this diagram, we can see that uh, uh, recently its uh, uh, dystopian uh, literature reached the level of its golden era. Golden era was a Cold War time in the 50s and the 60s. Of course, there is no doubt about this historical importance of dystopian uh, fiction. We use dystopian fictions, or they are serving as a def defense mechanism and assistance in recognizing this dark world in the future. But we should not forget that we already live in such scenarios. For example, uh, Neuralink. Uh, uh, from Elon Musk's company, or Metaverse, uh, where is uh, Black Mirror's references are obvious here. And But if you look uh, out of our Western context, especially in the global South, uh, lots of people live in such scenarios for many years, but we don't need to go like uh, far away. If we, uh, if we look also around us, uh, uh, people living in ages of coal, or so-called developed world in Europe, also living in a kind of very dystopian uh, 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 scenarios. And this popularity of dystopian future scenarios also implied a certain dangers, that it could let people understand catastrophic scenarios as unavoidable, uh, which makes them as passive instead of proactive. So like, uh, uh, we see all around lies this uh, dystopian, catastrophic, apocalyptic scenario, and we slowly became passive. And as we can see in this our diagram, uh, these dystopian uh, scenarios of the future have a direct impact on the present, creating a something, a kind of temporal loop, and stopping any possible radical improvement. So we are living in the in the present when. All the future scenarios are quite dystopian. For us, it's impossible to imagine any kind of future which is uh, uh, kind of optimistic or bright, uh, since everything around us or future around us, it's, 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 it's uh, dystopian and, and apocalyptic and dark. And such, we can say, or call it like Netflixization of the future, it's a, of course a result of the dystopian media production, but also demand of the uh, of, the, of of us from us from the consumers it, it created the future that is uh, like, again linear and predictable and we don't have like uh, any more uh, such a nice cone or such a nice uh, possibility for uh, positive or the um, uh, multiplicity of the future and we can say that it's important to start thinking again about different, again, not linear future and not centralized future. This dystopian thinking requires some counterbalance or positive visions of the future. And uh, all this uh, in, in this, like th this part of the lecture was uh, basically before the pandemic and before the war in UK Ukraine and in that context, uh, which was like basically first decade of the 2060s, uh, sorry, in, in, of, of this century, uh, we started to building our approach at our university, in, 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 at our department. And uh, in that context, uh, uh, we, we named this approach uh, speculative Mediterranean approach. Uh, which was practiced far away from the European urban and technological centers on the so-called the edges of the Europe. And our focus on the speculative practice or our practice in design was uh, on implication of, of important global topics in the local context or how emerging technological, economical, social and political changes will impact the, impact the context of Mediterranean South 
east of Europe. And this approach resulted in a series of works titled uh, Mediterranean Speculative Trilogy. They are kind of works which uh, with aim to uh, first uh, uh, start discussion, think about possible futures, but also trying to offer some possible uh, scenarios for the uh, for the building uh, uh, resi uh, resiliency in the future. And I will start, I will show you first uh, one of the, our first projects for 2000, from 2014, which is classical speculative design project. Uh, and the theme, theme of the project was a smart city because at that time we were like uh, part of the big European uh, uh, FP7 before uh, Horizon uh, project dealing with the smart city, which, which was kind of buzzword, was kind of uh, uh, really like one of these like uh, uh, hype technology in that time. And in our near future story, it's, uh, it's a fictional story and it's based on the, our tradition in Mediterranean, of Mediterranean tradition of city-states. And our city, Eutropia, it's a city, Eutropia, it's a city uh, which uh, economical and political status are based on the trade of the citizen uh, private in informations. So this kind of new fictional information-based economy gives independence and uh, welfare to all the citizens. And the scenario, its question is, what about privacy uh, in this welfare city of the future? And city developed a state-of-the-art infrastructure for collecting this data, and citizens uh, voluntarily cooperate to assure the constant flow of information. I will show you just like a few minutes of this video which is presenting this project.
Okay, so what we, we, we have here, we have like a scenario, a scenario of possible future dealing with uh, uh, what could be one of the outcomes of the smart city. The smart city is not just the intelligent technology, which is optimizing our like everyday life, that it could uh, maybe end up in a different direction. And what about like individuality? What about privacy in this like uh, possible uh, uh, future world? So we designed a, a kind of uh, objects you have seen here. Uh, we were thinking about possible technology, which could be possible uh, to be implemented in such a scenario. And, uh, and we produced not just the video, but it was exhibition and uh, with all these object views in this video. And we're generating uh, quite intensive discussion about like uh, possible outcomes of the, of the smart cities. And the second project I'm showing today, it's a project from 2070s which was focused on autom automis automatization of, of, of the work and labor in the local context. Uh, uh, here we are dealing with automation of the cruising sailboats. Everyone was talking about like automation of the, uh, of the cars, but for us in the local context was uh, uh, something else was interested. And so, we were speculating how it will change related occupations. So we went it, uh, at uh, Split Harbor Master Office and we uh, collected data that uh, uh, the skipper, the skipper who is uh, uh, operating on the touristic sailing boats were the, one of the most growing uh, occupation and, one, and became one of the most popular occupation. And we were speculating what it could be in the future if uh, if the the all sailing boats would be uh, automated uh, uh, would be automated uh, in, in automatization, uh, so it, it, which uh, could be run by the computers. Uh, so the, this project brings this uh, near future story about the last keeper, the guy uh, who refused. Uh, to leave his boat or to, to give like a, a machine to operate his boat. And it's a story about this once uh, romantic and one of the most popular occupation, uh, which in the near future com come to extinction by the automated uh, uh, sailing boat systems. Uh, it was also produced as a kind of uh, installation, but I will show you just uh, a little bit uh, part of the video. Bude interesantno ljudi. Mislim to je kad poslali interesantno. E, umislio ti putuješ Ali... po svijetu i upoznaš ljudi, ljudi dolaze se upoznava s tebom i još dobiješ neku. <laughs> e, to je vrlo interesantno. E? Ovo zadnje. E? Pa već danas postoji intencija da posada na pogotovo velikim trgovačkim brodovima zapravo samo rad gleda rad elektronike, praktički elektronika upravlja brodom veći dio plovidbe od isplovljavanja do uplovljavanja u luku. Osnovno moje mišljenje je da skipera ne može niko zamijeniti. Nije da stroj, nije da ja znam, tehničko dostignuće. Neko to uvijek mora biti presutan. Pa za očekivati da bi eventualni ljudi na brodu samo e, mogli uživati u plovidbi dok bi cijeli posao za njih objavila elektronika. Ne, meni to, ne, to nije to. Ne. Ja mislim da to nije to. Ne, toliko daleko ne možemo razmišljati. Mislim, skiper, kad skiper, vjerojatno neće umoriti. On će mora biti na brodu. On će mora biti, šta ja znam, na letilici. Danas, sutra, šta ja znam, pristi. Neko će mora s tim. Ljudski faktor ne, neće biti isključen. U nijekom slučaju. Računalo se ne umara, računalo u proračunu ne griješi i računalo uvijek igra na sigurno. Čovjek je sklon i umaranju, ali čovjek je sklon i riskiranju, što računalo nikad neće biti. E, kada bi računalo bilo dovoljno sigurno da se u nijednom trenutku neće dakle, doći do nekog poremeća u radu računala, onda bi vjerojatno bilo sigurnije od ljudske posade i zaočekivati je da na neke duge pruge da će računalo moći sigurnije upravljati e, brodon od čovjeka. 
A mislim, osim toga, skiper uz to što je skiper, ako ima malo afiniteta za neke druge stvari, kada je s gostima tipa skoči tumore, izvaditi hobotnicu i takve neke stvari, Viškulke. to je već to, niti jedan stroj neće moći napraviti. se i to proda automatizirala sa i filomena a šta ti fali ovako bolje ti je smjeno nije ti dosadno a ne dam ja tebe nikome a ko zna ili radi ova kamera Bit će me kapetanija gleda, evo ako me gleda, evo da vidimo da radi, evo izgleda da radi, izrade. Evo moramo voditi dnevnik, pratiti sve živo i zapisivati u dnevnik, jel to radi kapetanije moramo sve, jer oni gledaju, moramo to paziti, sve da bude tip top. E, gdje su sad svi oni moji skiperi? To je u kancelarijama, uredima, glume menadžere, bukiraju, ukrcavaju putnike, gledaju im sigurnost. A, a makinje na voze brode. Tili su snimi moj glas, ali nisam ja tija. Stroj može imat sva znanja, ali nema dušu kao i ja. Ok, so uh, what we had here, we have like uh, this contrast between like a present, these two uh, skippers and the scientists uh, talking about like a possible outcomes of the automatizations of the sailing boats. And then we have like uh, this fictional future story about this like guy who refused uh, uh, to automatize, to for, for refused automatization of his uh, uh, sailing boat. And uh, uh, we, uh, this project was a part of the Vienna Biennale uh, and, and the part of exhibition uh, titled How We Will Work, How We Will Work in the Future. And we presented as a kind of anthropological Uh, anthropological archive with uh, kind of video documentaries and artifacts from the past, from the from the occupation from the past, and we had all this like uh, uh, originals uh, photo from the skippers uh, with uh, with uh, uh, with their crew and and the model of the ship, how it uh, looked like before the uh, this new generation of automatization of the boats. And here, uh, uh, the first project was just like uh, uh, our our vision of the of the of the smart city of the future. But this time, we include different star stakeholders in design process: uh, uh, scientists, uh, uh, skippers, and uh, and people from the city harbor office. And this project raised intensive discussion both with the public and experts. There were lots of like uh, writings about this project, not, not in, the, uh, in, in, in the academic or, or art design based magazines, but you know, in, in, in some kind of uh, mainstream uh, uh, publishing, publishing production. For us, this was really important because uh, like uh, uh, scientists and skippers Uh, we were uh, working with them in this project, like for them was the first uh, possibility or first occasion to think about uh, uh, these possible futures. The, the third project is from 2080s, and it was focused on the climate changes on the Adriatic Sea. And uh, it was caused by this uh, situation that uh, in 2008 is uh, 80 uh, 
uh, Adriatic uh, achieved the highest sea, sea temperature ever. 30 degrees was the highest sea temperature measured ever on the Adriatic Sea. And, and the project intended to provide a, a possible alternative scenarios to expected climate futures. Uh, offer uh, to offer alternative scenarios and to prepare us for the possible post-apocalyptic Mediterranean. But also we, we want to offer a concrete tools, techniques and mechanisms which could help individuals and communities in rebuilding their lives after disaster and to provide a kind of new hope in the new beginning. And this fictional near future story, uh, this time is situated in 2055, uh, the second half of the 21st century, when uh, global climate changes resulted in uh, extreme changes of life and economic conditions in the eastern part of the Adriatic. And split our city, uh, it's a historical city, uh, just briefly about the city, which used to be a very important industrial center uh, in the second part of the 20th century, mostly known for its uh, large shipyard. And, but through the transition at the end of the last and the first quarter of this century, became a city with economy, economy entirely re relied on the tourism. So it's a kind of, uh, when we do speculative projects, we think about like present and trying to uh, anticipate the future starting for the present, which is happening now. So it's very important to understand, understand the present and to connect the present with the, uh, with the future. And uh, we are talking about like near, uh, near future, not some kind of far distant uh, science fiction future, but something which could be really possible looking at the present today. And in our scenario, uh, slowly with uh, climate changes, with climate uh, disaster, tourism at the more, as a, the most important economic sector disappeared completely. Migration has started with the collapse of tourism and number of citizens uh, fled toward the inland and the northern parts of, the, parts of the Europe. And those who stayed tried to use sea level rising and the penetration of the seawater inside the historical city core, also the raising temperature of the sea and the uh, intensive saliniz salinization of the, of, 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 of the, of the sea, seawater, as, uh, as opportunity for the future, as a kind of new hope. And in this scenario, historical city centers are becoming places for the new forms of food production. The Central Asian Square in Split became becomes one of the city pools for the new mariculture uh, for extremely resistant sea organisms, unicellular algae, branch strips, which is kind of really like small strips, and sea anemones. And this sur surrounding buildings are used for production, drying, preserving, packaging, and preparation for distribution, and citizens are organized in the small cooperatives in split in 2055. So at the beginning, we started the investigation in, in the local context, it's, uh, in the speculative practice, it's always important, this collaboration with the, with the experts. And this time we collaborated with the Institute of Sea Studies and Fishery, and we worked together uh, on these background scenarios, uh, and we carried the research together to find these resistant organisms to work on uh, set up installation or to work on to set up installation with algae, shrimps, and anemones, which forms elements of this food chain, uh, uh, a cycle. So on the left, you can see uh, algae, which kind of uh, this uh, green stuff in the, in the sea water. In the middle, these small shrimps, which are really like really small, small one. And, and on the right, we, we see sea anemones, which is kind of uh, the most important uh, part of this uh, uh, maricultural installation or food chain. So we cultivated algae using the minerals and light, uh, which uh, served as a food for the branch shrimps. 
and which we use later as a food for, for anemones. Of course, everything in collaboration with the experts uh, from the Institute. And after one month, we achieved a growth of all species. So installation was working and we transferred all in the gallery space and we invite the chefs, chefs from the local cooks association as a partners, and they prepared and demonstrated the new food potential of the mariculture of the near future. So they uh, cooked at the exhibition opening a uh, 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 sea anemone risotto, which was possible for the, all the uh, uh, visitors to try. And during the exhibition, we also uh, called the experts from the Institute and we organized an educational workshop for the students and the high school pupils about uh, this practical aspect of cultivation of marine organisms for the food and other production. And we also had a workshop with the small kids uh, elementary school about uh, life after disaster in our town. So they uh, designed a different uh, possible uh, uh, solution for the for the sea uh, uh, for the uh, sea rising in, in, in our city these are like uh, houses with the legs and stuff like this and after one month grow in the gallery uh, we got like new anemones and uh, and and lots of like uh, new living beings and and this all the newborn anemones uh, which uh, didn't end up in the risotto has been returned back in the sea at the same spot we collected them at the beginning and i will show you a little bit this video which is covering the whole process but i will show you just a few minutes Mali račici njihova kapsula se obogačava metalom, 
imaju posebne firme šta rade i kako bi oni šta prije dekapsulirali, da ne čekaju po nekih 16 sati do 20 dok se dekapsulaciji. We also, as a kind of outcome, it was just this project was not just like uh, raising awareness, discussing, in discussing, but we, we we wanted to offer something like more concrete. So we published this uh, do-it-yourself guide for uh, guide for building money culture. So it's it's a print and online, so everyone uh, could using our this like uh, manual uh, could construct the, the 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 exact exactly the same. Uh, maricultural setup and our focus was all, always uh, since uh, we have academic institution how to transfer our projects in, into education and from 2004 we are running a series of uh, multidisciplinary international workshops uh, inviting students from uh, not only from design but from architecture uh, it social science and so on and so on uh, dealing with uh, contemporary design practices, uh, always trying to act uh, within the local context, which is for us is very important. And in this context, uh, we started uh, to discuss uh, uh, or primarily focus in our activities on educational context uh, in order to critically reflect educational practice in, in this area. Uh, and in area of design and the field of design generally, since uh, there is a quote from my colleague, uh, James Auger, uh, who is now teaching in Paris, uh, since uh, there's still a lot of mainstream design and design education, it's, uh, con it's stuck in the last century modernistic notion of design or, or it's connected with the design uh, so-called common design means that design is good, design improves people, people's lives and design solves problem, which is, of course, uh, sometimes uh, true, but, you know, unfortunately, we see uh, always around us that it's uh, most of the times it's, it's really not true that uh, design uh, sometimes uh, it's really not good and then sometimes uh, uh, doesn't solve the people problems, you know, but, you know, brings uh, even more problems and even like uh, makes uh, people lives harder and for us as education educa educators this task we want to achieve is quite hard we want to move students from the problem solving and this market perspectives of design then we want to bring them uh, these critical tools and methods at, at the end of course as outcome uh, we want to generate a new concrete outcomes or kind of uh, visible social actions or, or something similar. And in 2018, we started European uh, project uh, Speculative Edu uh, with the intention to look into speculative and also related design and or design education in, in general by collecting, exchanging and extending existing uh, knowledge and experience with six partners. and. Uh, in almost two and a half years, we were mapping speculative design landscape in order to bring uh, an overview of the contemporary speculative practice. Uh, we conducted uh, more than five, 50 interviews with a number of practitioners and educators from this field. And we got also additional open call for the case studies. Everything is uh, um, still documented in this like uh, website where you can find everything you need about like uh, speculative and related design practice or design practice today. Uh, we also hosted uh, some educational activities. This one was in Rome, very interesting, in uh, summer school in 2019 with the topic in neo-rural neo neo futures. Everyone was dealing with urban future, but our focus was on, uh, on the rural future and this event was really like uh, interesting and maybe with important outcomes and through all these activities uh, we have opened a series of new questions uh, about like our practice about the role of design about like uh, uh, relations in between uh, technology and the society and then uh, during the project uh, we end up in the dystopian future.
so for for us and the question for us the question it's 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 what now uh, when this uh, life uh, after disaster is becoming uh, uh, life with disaster when uh, where and when speculations became our reality uh, where there are no any more this uh, techno heroic future as uh, Ursula Le Guin uh, was talking about uh, uh, where a speculative future oriented design practices now becoming more and more ever mainstream practices where uh, speculation are becoming a reality uh, and uh, when we see that this all narratives are back the technology will be crucial in our survival in the future and all this opens a new series of questions for the speculative design practice dealing with the past present and the future past parts of the practice and at the first look uh, the most visible legacy of the speculative design practice is a number of projects dealing with the dystopian futures we uh, we we have seen in the past a uh, 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 tons of the uh, uh, of, of the project dealing with the different kinds of disasters, diseases, wars, climate disaster, totalitarian state, technological dystopias, etc., etc. This one, uh, for example, was uh, from 2007, Sheer Candy, and it was like uh, related with the bird flu, uh, epid uh, bird flu, uh, uh, time or or. or or it was like uh, not not it's it's it started to be began as a kind of pandemia pandemic disease in, in that time there was like lots of uh, speculation about this situation in 2017 and uh, we we hear from from our uh, uh, community there is lots of arguments like uh, we have told you you didn't prepare you haven't done done anything to avoid this uh, and uh, but uh, we have to be very critical since uh, those views leading in in the despair and the, the when the state of the practice uh, when dystopians became are uh, becoming normality but from the positive side if you look in, 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 into the recent disasters when we talk about these disasters we are not talking about uh, just pandemic there is like uh, uh, lots of disasters around us uh, uh war in ukraine uh, different small disasters but of course the biggest one which is like uh, uh standing above all of us is is, is, is the climate change disasters uh, from this positive side uh, we see a number of great efficient alternative bottom-up methods to deal with pandemic pandemics often uh, coming from the margins economical uh, geogra geographical margins for example and uh, including collaborative practices like uh, permaculture makers community uh, community and do-it-yourself media media and, and 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 others one example from from our perspective it's uh, we we got like a, a really strong earthquake in Croatia in 2021 and uh, we have seen that you know this bottom-up self-organized community actions uh, has been has been proved as a faster and offered better results than the government top-down systemic mechanism for dealing with disasters and after the project uh, we were interested in uh, uh, what we have learned in this almost 20 years of the practice and how to use this knowledge in the future. As uh, I said before, the speculative design appeared as a result of uh, dissatisfaction with the state of design and the design education of over the many years, but also state of the world, of course. And uh, we hope that it has created a small foundation of design to move forward. And we see also that one of the important ways is re-education and it could offer some insights how to help uh, uh, or how to answer these important questions how we can educate uh, students for the decades uh, to come and to contribute to this discussion uh, we published a book 
uh, which is including our overview of the practice with reflection of the past. We are choosing historical references on the present. We select case studies and employ the approaches, tools, and methods. And future part with this critical view of the speculative practice. And the book is here. And uh, at the end of the book, we have summarized uh, a kind of, uh, it, it is kind of manifesto. Uh, of, we summarize a few challenges to aim, that aim to improve the ways in which we teach, perform, and evaluate it, uh, not just speculative, but design in, in the project. And these challenges deal with or talk about uh, that uh, if we are going to reclaim the future, we need to start from the present. So present is important for us, not just the future, uh, that we have to focus on the real world and uh, remove ourselves from the, this glamorous dystopian world from the future, for the future. And the design is about uh, both means and ends, uh, that we should not forget the design always has consequences. Uh, and that we should start with action uh, now and here, not waiting for some disaster, the apocalyptic uh, the, uh, scenarios, apocalyptic uh, scenarios in the future to start from the uh, from the scratch. Uh, that we could learn from the margins uh, in the periphery. Uh, the design practice in uh, is in collaboration and participation. And uh, the designer practice is primarily still local. And as uh, uh, one of our colleagues uh, said, the speculation is a duty, not a privilege. Uh, you can still uh, buy the book via our, our, uh, our uh, online distribution. Uh, but uh, if you Write me, there is still free for educational institutions, libraries, different courses, so you can order it for free uh, from us. And that's basically uh, all for this uh, lecture or presentation. Uh, you can find more things uh, or more info on our like uh, social networks. And now I'm gonna open this, uh, uh, panel for for the question discussion comments uh, anything you want to uh, learn more about this practice as i said before it's a multidisciplinary practice is something which uh, could be uh, part of your future part of research or or or, or personal practice or or academic uh, uh, research thank you Thank you very much, Professor Ivica, for, for your interesting presentation. For any participants who are willing to, well, to ask any questions, we invite you to, to write them on, on the chat. I will be reading them to Professor and he will, uh, and he will answer them. In the meantime, uh, while some of you may write your questions, I I would like myself to to ask a question to to the speaker, and um, it has uh, my question has to do with the economy of attention. This so to uh, this so called economy of attention, which is which is usually an aspect overlooked when it comes to uh, when it comes to criticizing the, the 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 actual development of technology and our and our usually. A toxic relationship as as humans and as societies with technology, which consists basically the economy of attention, broadly speaking, is uh, well all the economic influx, the economic uh, benefit that that great uh, companies obtain out of our attention. This is the case of social media platforms, for example, who whose main Profit consists of having as paying attention to them as much as they can, and uh, it, it creates a, an evident conflict because the whole wealth of information that is available online for us and that is absolutely incredible. This is an opportunity that generations before didn't have, and it is extremely valuable. 
it is somehow contaminated by this fact, by this economy of attention that make humans slaves of technology instead of their owners. How could speculative design and, and these critical approaches to, to, to it um, work and, and think of futures where these uh, relations with technology are not so toxic anymore and, and we can relate on, on the huge benefits of technology for our own good and not become slaves of, of Twitter and Instagram. Thank you, thank you, Juan. It's a perfect question, but it's something which is uh, really impossible to answer, you know, to, to give solution. And we are here and, and as, as a critical uh, practitioners or criti critical researchers or critical academic in order to uh, constantly uh, make make you aware as a, as a people coming from uh, academia research background that we we have to be aware not to take technology for granted you know to think about like uh, all the possible implications of the technology which is uh, something uh, you have mentioned now which is something we see all around of us there is a, of course there's a tons of project in the critical and speculative design dealing with something like this but not only in the critical and speculative design um i mentioned black mirror for example and and lots of like uh, 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 critical uh, mainstream pop cultural production but uh, of course there's a problem of the system you know capitalism is a system which is uh, uh, reappropriating or swallowing everything around us you know so there is also specular design became as a really critical practice and now if you see this it's a part of you know google team uh, there is a career you can uh, uh, you can uh, uh, you can go to you or you can achieve in the in the practice in speculative design and um, and and it is something which is uh, uh, connected with the whole education in overall in in general sorry uh, and uh, this critical view should be uh, included in in all levels of education not not just on this academic level but you know starting from the elementary school then to the high school and then to the uh, and then to the of course this academic level and something I see uh, especially uh, if you look at uh, uh, IT or technological orientated uh, uh, faculties or even uh, economy faculties uh, dealing with uh, economics, uh, there is a really like a lack of any kind of critical perspective in, in education. And of course, in design, I'm just like I'm talking more in design. Design was, uh, as I said before, one of the driver of this consumerism. Everything is design, and design is also part of this like idea of uh, creating a, a consumeristic society. But it's something which is uh, we are just a, a kind of a, a small number of practitioners uh, trying to think and to be critical. But it should be uh, implemented in every element and every part of education. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor. Uh, there are some comments on, on the chat, but mostly uh, saying thank you for, for your presentation and appreciating uh, the content that has been developed here. We are also very close to the, to the time limit. It's uh, 12.25 right now. Uh, I, will, I will write this my email here so everyone if you want to ask me something uh, uh, absolutely. Or, or look at the speculative uh, Ed or, or, or ask for the book uh, uh, feel free to do it we still have some books for the uh, for the educational purposes so anyone who wants to the Nicola is wants to ask something Nicola hello yes exactly hello Nicola now you have your uh, microphone activated yeah you okay yes. perfect <laughs> you're a hard host Juan not allowing me to unmute myself it, uh, it, it was great as always I was wondering you know uh, in a sense you know how idea.org did uh, package the human center design as a tools which are easily understandable for non-designers do you see this uh like uh is it possible to package some ideas uh behind speculative design in forms of tools that could be used as non-designers 
Yes, of course, uh, we see speculative design for our practice. We have organized lots of like workshops, uh, as I said before, as a kind of workshop with, uh, which brings like this multi or interdisciplinarity. And one of these, for me, one of these advantages of this approach is this kind of, it's, it's a kind of, uh, most of the time, kind of really nice, like, uh, uh, let's say, like a hub, uh, or, or, or common discussion point where we bring like uh, people from different disciplines with which are not afraid anymore uh, from which which is not afraid anymore uh, of design because you know for people coming from non-design perspective designs look something which is you have to be artist creative or or it's something really like uh, uh, design it's not something we, we are against this design of you know like uh, designer hero designer stars and so on you know mystification of design it's a speculative design trying to to destroy this idea of this modernistic vision of design as a genius you know who will like design everything around uh, around us you and we we're going to worship so uh, the the as you said as you see the, the idea of the speculative critical design practice is to bring people around to to do things in a participatory way, you know, including not just the researchers and scientists, but, you know, also like, uh, uh, I don't want to say like users, you know, but common people in, in this design process and trying to demystificate design and the process. So there is in the book, there is lots of like, I think tools or, 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 uh, uh, or ideas, how everyone can use, you know, design in their everyday practice, you know, not in the way that everyone is designer because there is still needs some skills and stuff to be designer, but, you know, to democratize uh, this practice and to bring people, you know, uh, this approach or design in everyday life. Thank you very much again, Professor. Um, since there are no further comments on on the chat um and we are almost reaching the the time limit established for for this presentation i i guess it's it's time to to adjourn the event saying thank you very much you. Uh, to all attendees here and uh, professor if if you just well uh, because anything anything else just for for the attendees to 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 have it clear in the next few weeks on the one hand in the next few weeks certificates of attendance will be issued to to all of you to the email account you used to register at at this event and on the other hand in the next uh, few days, both this presentation and each of its three sections will be uh, available on on YouTube. And apart from that, uh, the links to the well to the booklet uh, that uh, Ivica has been telling about the speculative edu dot eu uh, website and so on will be made available on the research you projects website so that you can have all the information that has been provided during uh, this presentation in the same place and you have access to this whole wealth of of information about the speculative design methodology so that's it if professor if you want to close the the, the event saying uh uh, last few words um, the floor is yours i just have to say now thank you very much for your interesting presentation that well of, of this methodology that so to speak looks into the into the future with with an open mind challenging uh, mostly accepted assumptions but that is precisely how growth uh, is made possible by challenging the the status quo so thank you very much uh Thank you everyone for uh, for attention and of course the book is uh, it's still possible to read and as a free PDF on the on the website so everyone can access it also as an online in online version. Thank you very much and thank you to to all of you once again. See you on the next spin-off competence lab webinar. Goodbye. Bye bye.